Today is going to be about some of the things that didn't go right. I'm not going to call them disasters, but they didn't go to plan. Are you ready? Hey there, it's Barbara Talisman from Where's Babs. Welcome back to the channel. So I've been sharing with you my travels over the last two and a half years as a solo nomad in retirement. In 2021, I quit my job in San Diego. Many of you know that from my previous videos. And in the process of moving out of that apartment and selling everything I had in order to get downsized, to get on the road full time, I start cleaning out an apartment that I had only lived in for about eight months. And I go into a cabinet that, and I open it up and in the back of the cabinet is nothing but black mold. And then I go look underneath the, the cooktop, black mold. Next corner cabinet, black mold. I am like, oh my God, I've been living in this place for eight months with black mold. It ends up that there was black mold from a leaky refrigerator water line that had probably been there. It's a brand new building. It had probably been growing since the day the building was built, maybe a year before I moved in. And of course I'm trying to move out and I've got stuff in there and I have to get stuff out of there to sell. And they move me into another, they have furnished apartments that you can rent when family members come to visit. And they move me in. I'm thinking this timing, I mean, I'm glad I'm moving out, but I need to get to the stuff, you know? So that was the beginning. That was like the first month of me being retired and trying to get the heck out of San Diego. It was a pain in the neck. So let's go on to Puerto Varta. As many of you know, I had taken back-to-back -back cruises for about four or five weeks on and off from Los Angeles down around Mexico and back up. And I got off every Tuesday in Puerto Vallarta to look for an apartment. My plan was to move to Puerto Vallarta. I think at the time I was thinking permanently. Um, it's a little bit of one of those leap and a net will appear moments that I have in my life. So I found this apartment. It was an older apartment. Um, big block owned by a very, very rich woman in uh, Puerto Vallarta who owns a lot of real estate. And I had found what I thought was a really good real estate agent and he'd been very flexible and take me to a couple of areas so I could see what was going on. I had also been introduced to another woman who was coming back to Puerto Vallarta. She had lived there on and off for a number of years. We were both women of a certain age and single. And so we started talking and thought, well, you know, let's look for an apartment together. And I told her I'd been working with this guy. So she started to come with me. So we were looking for a two bedroom, two bath, and he took us to it. It had not been rehabbed yet, but would be ready by November. And we're thinking, well, November is fine. She had a place to stay. I was going to just go on and get some other, some other cruises done. And when it was finished, I would just get off the cruise, you know, in LA and fly down to Puerto Vallarta. So that happens. We sign a lease, we give a deposit, the whole thing. And um, we find out it's not ready yet. So, you know, that happens in Mexico and there's not a lot that you can do about it, um, but backup plans. So we sort of didn't have a backup plan. She was actually living in a condo that belonged to her ex. So it had two bedrooms and um, we agreed that I could move in there while we're waiting imminently two to three weeks for this apartment to be ready. And um, Mexico time was not two or three weeks at all. Well, we quickly find out that we have very different lifestyles. She's a party animal. She likes to go out drinking all night. And of course I get up early, I go for a walk, I go to my Spanish lessons, I'm finding food and walking along the beach and taking Zumba in the morning. And I think he says that we can move in probably just before, just after Thanksgiving. And I get a text that week from her saying, um, I've decided that I like my lifestyle and I want to be able to have lots of friends over and have big parties in the apartment and go out drinking and all of that sort of stuff. So I am going, I think she said, I'm going to take the apartment and you can find someplace else to live. And my response to that was, no, I'll be moving in on the 12th or 15th, whatever the day was in November, and I'll look forward to seeing you there. And so she said, well, then I'm going to find someplace else to live. And I said, that's fine. And as I've said in other videos about living in Puerto Vallarta, it was well within my budget at $1,400 a month. It was a huge apartment. And so I was very happy. So November 15th, somewhere around there, we're supposed to move in. I'm supposed to move in by myself, which is fine. And it comes and it's the day before and I'm not hearing anything. And it becomes silence from the real estate agent who is the go between with the landlord. And this goes on and I move into the Hotel Rosita, which was okay. It was close by, but I'm moving luggage and things like that. And it ends up, oh, another week and then another week. 
So I think I ended up moving in early December, something like that. Um, and he's telling me it's all ready and the whole day goes. She, the landlord actually moves me into the Alamar for about four days um, while she's finishing up this renovation. Eight o'clock, he picks me up from the Alamar and we walk into the apartment and it's the only thing that's been touched is that the furniture has been installed. Air conditioners have been installed a long time ago and all the kitchen appliances, but everything else, the bathrooms had not been touched. The kitchens had not, the kitchen had not been touched. The floor, the place was a mess. I mean, it had like construction dust everywhere. The floors were supposed to be resealed or retiled. Um, it was a real mess. And um, it's eight o'clock at night. He gets her on the phone. I said, this is not ready. She said, okay, well, your options are you can move out and I'll give you your money back um, and we'll just break up the lease or you take it as is. So this is a really typical Mexican standoff kind of thing that landlords and expats get sometimes. You get a bad actor in there. The real estate agent suddenly didn't become interested in all at this. And I'm thinking it's eight o'clock at night. I've already moved out of my hotel room. What is it that I'm supposed to do? So I agreed to, to take it and then the work began. Oh my God, pictures and photographs back and forth. And now I'm in touch directly with her manager and her construction crew and this landlord and, and the real estate agent guy is gone. And stuff just kept happening. Uh, the hot water heater didn't work. The dryer was not hooked up. The floors were not finished. All the toilets started leaking from the bottom, you know, from the base. Um, there was no water pressure in any of the showers. It was kind of a, a disaster and it was about a month and a half of living in a construction zone. The door didn't work. Like the door, you could have just put your shoulder against the door and, and broken in. And when it finally got to the point where I realized no work was going to be done, I said, fine, I'm not paying you rent until, and until you fix everything. And she totally got that very quickly and suddenly things started happening. From what I understand, the crew and the manager had no idea that she had rented this apartment and they didn't know when they had to finish it. They were really nice people and they were trying on the ground to help me. So once it was fixed, it was pretty good. Um, it was nice, and then you can look at the other video on how I ended up living there for free by renting out the other bedroom and bathroom. Um, but it was just a really rocky start to my living in Puerto Vallarta. You can watch other things that I did in Puerto Vallarta and how I decided where to live, but that's sort of the um, real estate disaster of living in Puerto Vallarta while I was um, my first six, seven months in retirement. Let's talk about lessons learned in Puerto Vallarta. And you can also watch, listen to my podcast with John Schmidt, who lives there six months out of the year. And he has some good real estate tips on there. But if you're moving to Puerto Vallarta, I think, or any foreign country, just buyer beware, renter beware. Just be aware that stuff can go wrong. Um, lots of people in Puerto Vallarta afterwards told me about their stories about construction and rehab of apartments that they rented or bought. And so that happens. In the end, it was fine, right? It was just going through it. So, bounce back. So from Puerto Vallarta, I moved to Chicago. I moved to Chicago April of 22 until what was supposed to be November of 22. And I rent an apartment for seven months in Aqua. Again, another video you can watch about life in Chicago. It was great until something started happening in my health. And I was like, well, well this is interesting. I remember it clearly, it was a Thursday and I'm sitting in the window doing some work, doing something. And it feels like there is something here in my eye and I'm thinking, oh, it's a sty. It was sort of blocking my vision a little bit. Look, and there's no red bump and I'm thinking, hmm. so this is Thursday. And, and then, you know, it sort of doesn't change. So I start Googling, you know, WebMD and all sorts of things. And you know how you get those floaters? If you're of a certain age, you probably know. And I have floaters, but they started turning into little stars that kind of go in front of your eye like this, and they're whitish, and they start doing this. So it's like they call them a shower of floaters. I said, okay, this is a distinct uh, symptom that I can look up. Well, it's called a torn retina. And I proceed to start calling around to find a retina specialist and a retina surgeon, an ophthalmologist, not an optometrist, an ophthalmologist who is a surgeon, an eye surgeon. And many of them couldn't see me right away. This is summer of 22. Um, there were comments about going to the emergency room, and, but their ERs were not staffed still post pandemic. And like many ERs, they had put up notices that there was eight hour waits or 12 hour waits. Um, and I'm not sure 
given what happens in Chicago or time of day, and I'm, going to, I'm running into a weekend here, um, how busy and how urgent my case would be. So I think I got in to see somebody really late on Friday. And he says, yeah, I need to get you in right away. It is not um, really bad yet. It's a small tear and we can fix it. And they repair the tear and they put a bubble behind your eye to hold the tear together, the stitches and the tear together so that it can heal. And depending on how big your tear is, uh, where it is, the kind of bubble they use to repair it and the gas they use in that bubble depends on how long your healing from this is going to take. So this is September 20th in Chicago. And he says, um, I said, okay, but if you're going to do this, I'm on a plane November 23rd to Iceland for a week. And then I leave for LA to fly over to Australia. He goes, yeah, well, there'll be no flying. And I said, okay, so no September 20th is October 20th. November 20th is eight weeks. He goes, oh, yeah, that's not going to be a problem because it's not a big tear. I can use a regular, uh, the right bubble and the right gas, and you'll be good by the 20th. It won't be a problem. The, and so what happens is that bubble sort of absorbs into your body over time. There's nothing you can do. It just has to do that. And the healing process is laying face down. You rent a chair. It's sort of like one of those massage chairs, except that your head has to be completely down, like parallel to the floor. And when you're walking around, that's how you have to walk around. And basically you're 45 minutes face down, 15 minutes sitting up, 45 minutes face down. Um, I went to see him 24 hours after in pain like I had never had in my entire life. The stitches in my eye were just unbelievable. And a week later um, to find that the bubble was fine, and I didn't have to sit in the chair anymore like that. And you're sleeping face down. So it was a very interesting eight weeks of no exercise, no Peloton. I think four weeks in, he allowed me to take a walk, uh, a light walk along the lake, but you also have this bubble in your eye. So any sun in your eye is like refracted in that bubble, no matter what your sunglasses are. You know, that's where the health concern on travel can be a problem and so it's kind of fortunate i was in chicago i will tell you i would never go back to that surgeon or his office again because i did not find them caring or knowledgeable or helpful once i had the surgery and the pain that i was in was just no joke and i have a very high tolerance for pain so that is one of those things that can go wrong when you're traveling is your health can go south um, and in the scheme of health like having a repaired retina is nothing compared to having like open heart surgery or some major break in a bone. So, you know, I get it, but I missed the trip to Iceland. I had insurance on it, so that was all reimbursed. Um, and I almost missed the flight to LA to get over to Australia, but like miraculously the day before, September 20th surgery, I was leaving for LA on December 3rd and December 2nd, literally, the bubble disappeared. It became a pin dot and then overnight it went away. So, and it put a little cramp in the rest of my time in Chicago for sure. I mean, that was September 20th until December 2nd. I was kind of restricted on activity and being careful not to jostle my eye. And you can't see, it's kind of a blur because you have this um, bubble in your eye. So that's my Chicago health story. And I guess I was very, very fortunate. I was in the United States in a city I knew with friends that I had. Well, in Chicago, this eye surgery was certainly unexpected. I'm sure many of you, and I will as well, go through some health scares or some health challenges. Um, you need to make sure that you're covered um, uh, health-wise and insurance and things like that and form a support group wherever you are. Um, and stuff happens, and we just have to you know, kind of roll with the punches and do the best we can to take care of ourselves and um, move on. So, Melbourne, I get on that plane out to LA and fly over to Australia. And that's all great. I have a house sit that starts that. And there's another video about that that you can look at. And then I rented this Airbnb for the rest of the time that I was there. So yes, beautiful Airbnb, huge apartment. Like I'd been living in a studio in Chicago, which was fine. And then this became this big apartment with all these amenities. Yeah, the oven didn't work. I, it, it, it would not heat up. The stovetop worked, the oven wouldn't work. And the blinds in the apartment, they have uh, blackout curtains, 
right across from the apartment is a garage, an eight or nine story garage. Very, very well lit, including spotlights that like come right into the building I was staying in. And I usually have my blinds open when I sleep at night because I love the twinkle of nightlight. Oh my gosh, this was like living under a spotlight when you, when you went to bed at night. You turned off your lights inside and then you had this glare of spotlight. So I mentioned it to him, uh, to the Airbnb host, and they go through a series of sending handymen over. I get an email or a text that says, okay, he was there, he's fixed the stove. And I asked him, my first question was actually, because I sent him the picture, I said, am I using this correctly? Because it is um, sort of a Euro stove with different knobs and things. And I said, please, if I'm using this wrong, let me know, because I'm fully willing to take that responsibility. And so I try again, and again, the convection works and all it does is blow cold air. I said, no, it's still not working. And I said, what are we doing about the drapes? Because he didn't do anything about the drapes. So he comes in while I'm there and he pushes them together. And I said, no, that's what I've done. And then they fall apart. Like they, you push them together and then they kind of just part, you know, and you push them together and they kind of part. I tried a, um, like a paper clip and thing. It was not doable. And he goes, no, no, I fixed it. Yeah. So this went on probably for two or three weeks. And here's one of my big mistakes was giving him the host the benefit of the doubt i had bought air cover I, you get air cover with every apartment so that if the host does something wrong airbnb steps in but i had also bought the insurance for this apartment on top of it with um airbnb note to you folks renting airbnb you must let them know within 72 hours of an issue and first it was 72 hours within moving in and then it was 72 hours within an issue happening and so i never got clarity on that so the benefit of the doubt of working with a host for us both to save our ratings on airbnb you don't give them the benefit of anything this went on for six weeks fussing with the stove sending a guy to look at the drapes then sending a guy to measure the drapes and then he measures the drapes in one were in the living room but not in the bedroom um, three guys to look at the oven to fix it and finally decide they're going to repair it and now there's an oven sitting in the middle of a very small kitchen because they had taken it out of the wall to see if it was wiring or whatever it was i said okay so i come home and i said okay there's now an oven in the middle of my kitchen what are you doing and that took two days to get and the, the curtain guy was really sweet and he comes to deliver the curtains and put them in and i said what about the bedroom and he goes they never told me about the bedroom and the guy, one of the, the guys who works for the Airbnb host says, looks at me. And I said, it's always been the living room and the bedroom. Why wouldn't he have measured the bedroom? And the guy just sort of shrugs and the curtain guy goes, that's right, just blame it on me. Sure, that's fine, just blame it on me. So just the way this Airbnb host communicated with me, communicated with his vendors, I said his handyman was completely worthless. This took six weeks. So he gave me something off. Um, I think he gave me like 10% off or something, which I don't think was enough. And I actually wanted to move out, but Airbnb, they wouldn't give me enough to find an apartment because at this point, the Australian Open was going on and um, the rates on Airbnb were insane. And it was just um, the way he handled it. He manages like 20 units in Melbourne. And so I just let Airbnb know, look, you know, this is just not acceptable. And their response was, you should have let us know. So here's the deal. When you move into an Airbnb, check everything. Do the toilets flush? Does the dish, dish, dishwasher work? Does the disposal work? Does the oven work? Do the blinds close so that you can sleep at night? Like check everything in the apartment. Because if you let them know within 72 hours of moving in, Airbnb absolutely takes responsibility. I'm not clear on the insurance that I bought with Airbnb whether it's within 72 hours of an incident or 72 hours of moving in. So, you know, it was a great apartment and, you know, I made it work, but the hassle of having to deal with this guy like every day, like, are you gonna fix the stove today? Are you gonna get the drapes fixed today? You know, I mean, like, it was just an ongoing issue. And he had a number of people that worked for him. So every time I would call or text, I'd get somebody new that had not, no idea about what was going on in my apartment. Oh, and that was the other thing. Almost every other Friday, someone knocked on my door asking when I was moving out. And I was like, I've rented this place for like two and a half months. Oh, well, we have you moving out today. It's like, no. So there's some miscommunication in, in scheduling. And then my key stopped working. 
<laughs> and I was like, what? And I go down to the front desk of the hotel, which actually has nothing to do with this apartment because he has rented or owns this condo. I'm not quite sure. And he's responsible for everything that goes on in that apartment. And the hotel has nothing to do with it. He tells me to go down to the front desk to get a new key. They tell me they can't give me a new key. And then they say, oh, well, if he sends us an email letting us give you a new key, then we can give you one. This took like three hours back and forth of, yes, she lives there. Yes, you need to give her a key. And um, then the guy knocks again on the door a couple weeks later saying, you're moving out today, right? And I said, no, I still have like a month left. And he goes, he said something about his key not working. So every key that they owned for every apartment in that building that they had stopped working. And they go, oh yeah, we didn't realize that the keys expire after a certain period of time. I mean, it was just, it was like, you know, Keystone Cops. So anyway, Melbourne was wonderful. It was just the apartment had a couple hassles. Yeah, so the Airbnb thing, um, I think a lot of us have found that it's gotten worse um, post-pandemic between really raising rates and hosts trying to gouge the market and not being as conscientious about how they're taking care of their guests. So I am more conscious of Airbnb reading reviews, which all seem to be good, and then you get there and they're not, and how the host responds to questions. So I don't typically book until I've asked the host the questions that I have. Um, and that gives me a pretty good sense of how they're going to be as a host when I arrive. So again, I think similar to Puerto Varda, you know, if you're renting Airbnb, VRBO, just do your due diligence and make sure you pay attention to the insurance that you carry or how that vendor, Airbnb or VRBO, is going to manage and help you who have paid money to stay there and how they will support you. So I finish in Melbourne. I take a beautiful cruise from Sydney back to LA and I have scheduled six, seven months worth of house hits in California. Again, another you know, video you can watch that's on the channel. Um, it's been a pretty good six or seven months. I mean, California is a beautiful place to be, but you are house sitting, right? So there is no house sit that's perfect. There are all sorts of things. Um, I had in this six months, cause I've, I've house sat a lot, but in this six months, I've had a house that desperately needed us a cleaning. Like I couldn't use the kitchen or the bathroom. It was bad. And it was only um, a couple nights and three days. I couldn't leave because I had an animal I was taking care of. Um, so I did not cook or leave anything in the kitchen. And I did not leave anything in the bathroom. I brushed my teeth and put it back in my kit. And uh, she, she, we did change the sheets before I before she left, I did meet her, but I hadn't looked around. Um, and then they're just uncomfortable beds, guest rooms that, you know, probably they have somebody staying in for a night or two, but not a month. Um, flat pillows and uh, soft mattresses that have a big dip in the middle, just could not get comfortable. Animals that were portrayed as being, oh, easy and fun loving were not pulling you down the street on the leash. I mean, I know how to control them, but it was not a pleasant, walk two or three times a day. And I'm just telling you the things that have happened because 95% of my house sits were fabulous. But it's just a matter of, you know, this is stuff that happens when you're house sitting. Um, and we have a lot of new hosts on Trusted House Sitter now. Now they want to start traveling again. So they've never been a host before. Oh, and the other thing is like no place to put your belongings to unpack. I mean, if you're, if you're staying for three to five, six weeks in a house, to have to live out of your suitcases isn't right. They should empty a dresser, um, put it into a Rubbermaid container or something, um, no place to hang your stuff, no room in the bathroom to put, you know, out the stuff that you use every day. And if it's only for a weekend or a couple of days, who cares? But when you're moving in and you're staying for a while, which is my preference, and you don't have any place to put your stuff, it's just not a comfortable sit. That stuff happens when you're house sitting. As I said, most of the time it's good, but it happens. The Trusted House Sitter app and other apps, um, there's a lot of conversation and discussion in our forums about how we review our hosts because it's a little one-sided at the moment. Um, hosts can kind of say anything they want about a sitter, but if a sitter says something bad about a host, um, we get dinged pretty badly because uh, other hosts won't select us. I think you just have to really do a lot of due diligence during your interview process and have open communication with your host um, while you're there. And it just becomes a challenge when you've committed to being there for four or five weeks and this is what it looks like 
you know, ahead of you. And it can, it can put a damper on what could be a really lovely stay wherever you are. So again, live and learn. If you watched my previous video on the pros and cons of, of solo travel, all of these issues and challenges and things that came up just made me more resilient, right? You gotta figure stuff out. And so, yeah, it went south, but I'm still here talking about it and I'm still traveling and I haven't given up. So I guess, you know, I wanted to share with you that it's not all, you know, roses and sunshine which I've been sort of sharing with you on this channel, um, and that there were issues and there have been issues and there will be more issues. The thing about this is, is how you handle it, how you want to handle it. There are lots of opportunities to say, oh, I just give up. I'm gonna rent an apartment somewhere and just go live. You know, I haven't, as I said, hurt myself badly enough that I have to give up. Although the eye surgery was kind of a throwback. So um, I hope you found this useful. Please like and subscribe, share it with friends. And I look forward to your comments. See you soon.